Okay, take 27 million. I'm having problems with this one. So, um, I'm looking at a study um, from the Oslo University. Uh, University Hospital, actually. Uh, headed up by Astrid Bjornbeck. Um, I want to go through first the candidates for this study. I'm going to read these because it's just like there's a lot of information. So originally there was 151 people in this study and they were comprised of users, non-users and previous users. Now the stipulations were that if they were a user or a non-user, a user or a previous user that they must have used for a cumulative period of 12 months or more. Now non-users couldn't have used for the last 12 months but they have to have 12 months usage total previously and current users were split between those that were currently on cycle and currently off cycle but still in the process of using and that was further split into those that felt they were dependent and those that felt they were non-dependent on steroid use. Now that group was 50 people, 23 reported as being dependent and 27 reported as non being non-dependent which contradicts actually the work from Pope which uh, would point to around 70% of users are now regarded as being dependent. So out of the 151, some were dropped because they weren't thought to be engaged in heavy resistance training. Some were dropped because they lied about the drug use because everything was verified by testing. Uh, some missed tests for this of a reason. But it resulted in 59 non-users, 50 users, and 16 previous users. Now age-wise, uh, non-users 30.7 years average. Users 33.6 years average and non-users, sorry, previous users 31.7 average. Why is this significant? Because this is basically people in their early 30s, which would, for all intents and purposes, throw out that there are any re age-related brain discrepancies going on here and that brain function lower is not down to being older. Uh, they looked at their education in a number of years. So non-users was 15.9. Users was 14.5 and previous users were 14.2. I have no idea if that has any significance, to be honest. Um, you could argue, but I think it'd be a bit of a weak argument, that those with a higher level of education were less likely to use. And they looked at IQs, and the average in the non users was 112, or the average in the users was 105. Again, not so sure if that bears any real significance, but it would appear that uh, non-users are brighter. Um, now everyone's going to jump down and say, well, I'm clever and I've got this and I've got that and I use. I know, I'm only reading the results. Uh, what did surprise me was the amount of time spent strength training. Um, non-users were 477 minutes per week. Users was 383 and previous users was 223. So the natties were spending twice as long in the gym as the ex-users. Is this because users are relying on the drugs more for training? Generally speaking, people regard users as being able to train longer and harder than natties and natties have to be a bit more conservative about their training. So I'm not sure why that is but i would suspect that it is because the results come easier with the drugs um obviously it's only a very small indication of what their training regimes were like and these can be very very varied so there could be several reasons for this but it is noted that users and previous users have significantly lower levels of interaction when it comes to training in the gym they also looked at cigarettes and alcohol both the number of people that, that smoke and drank and the amount they smoke and drank. And in both cases, the highest number of smokers and drinkers was in the non-user group. And when they looked at consumption, the lowest amount of tobacco was smoked in the non-user group, the highest amount was smoked in the user group, but the highest amount of alcohol was consumed in the non-user group. I would suspect that this would have something to do with users thinking that they shouldn't really be drinking while they're on. 
I may be wrong in this, but there's, the difference is quite significant. Um, non-users drank three times more alcohol than users did. Uh, none of the levels are particularly high. Uh, user level, sorry, non-user levels was 4.5 units on average per week, so still not big drinkers. But I do think that the usage and the perception of alcohol mixed with usage is probably what represents the fact that usage numbers are lower. And then they looked at medication. And the use of medication in the non-user group was very low. Uh, and only four people reported using medication at 59. And two of them were for antidepressants. Whereas 13 people in the user group reported using medication. And 10 of them were for antidepressants. And five people in the previous user group. And three of them for antidepressants. And I think it is notable that... Um, the user group, 20% of users are using antidepressants, where only 3% of non-users are using antidepressants. Now, the driving factors behind this could be twofold. We know it can be chemical. We already know there's studies out there to prove that these drugs can cause more depression and anxiety issues within users. That's done and done. That's tried and tested. But there is the other incidental factor of environment. Now, previous studies have shown that non-trained individuals have lower levels of depression than trained individuals or trained individuals that use, who have the highest levels of depression. And it's thought that this is to do with environment. You see, when you get involved in training, fitness, whatever it may be, you tend to seek others involved in that as well, both for information and for support, which means engaging in social media. So here we enter a world now of photographs galore. And if you didn't have body insecurity issues when you got into this stuff, you certainly will when you've been exposed to this. We're bombarded with images of the perfect body within these communities. Quite often these images are very well selected via angles or filters or whatever it may be, Photoshop and the rest. But all of a sudden we become much more acutely aware of our own body image and um, where previously we only compared our body image to our peer group, we're now comparing our body image to some of the best physiques in the world. This results in a change in our perception of our own physiques and generally a dissatisfaction with our own physiques that was greater than what previously motivated us to get involved with training in the first place. Hence, higher levels of depression because there is a higher level of body dysmorphia or body dysmorphia type imagery and viewing and thought processing, which results in us being more down about the way we look. On top of that, the chemicals would, would appear to have an action within the brain that also changes our perception as well. And we are less able to see the changes within our physiques. In fact, anecdotally, when I speak to a lot of users, they do report that um, since using, they've got more obsessed with body image and less happy with the way they look. And when I speak to a lot of ex-users, they actually say that now they've stopped using, they have finally come to accept their body image and feel a lot more comfortable in their own skin. So, definitely a few potential driving factors in that area. Then we look, it looks at problem behavior. And notable that only 21 people report total problem behavior in the control or the non-user group, why it's 33.8 in the user group and 42.8 in the previous user group. So potentially we have a link there between problematic behavior and usage. Strangely enough, the the Promotive behavior seems to be greater in those that have stopped using. Now, by probably behavior, this, this involves anxiousness and depression. It involves rule baking. It involves internalizing and externalizing problems. So what we're not talking about is just people being naughty. here. We're not talking about people committing crimes here. We're talking about a broader spectrum of problem behavior where they overanalyze themselves. They internalize problems and end up getting stressed over that. Or, or they have high levels of anxiety and depression, so it's not about really people committing crimes, though that element is in there. 
And so that is effectively the pre-study information about the people engaged within the study and what they've reported. Now, the study looked at how the brain worked, effectively. It concentrated on the major key elements of the brain, so the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the central cortex, the brainstem, and the amygdala. And it also looked at the networks that support these. So it looked at the DMN and the DAN. Now, DMN is default node network. Uh, and this is basically our, our um, control, our base control, our um, singling system for brain function at rest, non-stimulated brain function. And it noted that the difference between the non-user group and the X user group wasn't really that significant, but levels of activity in the X user group were lower than lower, sorry, than the non-user group. But the levels of usage within the, of, of stimulus, should I say, within the user group were a lot lower. In fact, regard, regarded as being significantly lower. Um, so it showed that the difference between user and previous user was small, but but there but the difference between non-user and user was large. It also noted that the network that controls signaling under stimulus, the DAN network, showed a similar thing. Now, what it, what it did show within this group was that not only the user group had a reduced DAN function, but also the previous user group had a reduced down function, particularly when it came to relationship with the amygdala. So basically signaling to the amygdala under stimulus was reduced in both user and non-user groups. Now, the amygdala is basically like a, it, it controls emotion and it controls our perception of emotion in others, so our empathy. It deals with fear and it's like a warning center for the brain. So it deals with reactions to fear. Uh, it also influences our risk perception. Um, and, and to some degree, our memory and our survival instincts. So what we're seeing is, is that a reduced signal process going to this part of the brain and a reduced signal process going to this part of the brain under influence or under stress or under stimulus. In other words, we don't view fear in the same way. We become slightly more reckless. Our risk management and our risk assessment changes, which would bar it, would support this increased use of uh, medications to a degree. Not significantly, I might add, but you, you can you could push a link there if you wanted to. But what it does show is that we are less likely to perceive emotions in others. And that's something that trend users report quite readily, is the fact that uh, they don't recognize emotion in others. They become cold and withdrawn to others, particularly loved ones. I do think there's an action here at the CB2 receptor in their Magladeer as well from trend. But also there is, there is obviously potential for this action to be happening here as well. Uh, this also changes the other thing that the, 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 the report notes too is that uh, users on their initial cycles report euphoric feelings, feelings of youth and vigor, but that this dissipates in previous cycles. And the longer they use for or the higher the dose, the more these, these, these feelings disappear. Now, I noticed this, but I always actually thought it was down to the difference between prescription which is what I used to use in my early days, and UGL, which is what I used in my later days. But it would appear it's not. It's to do with brain. Um, very much like alcohol, in that a low amount of alcohol is a stimulus, where a high amount of alcohol is a depression. It would appear that a low amount of steroids in its initial usage can be quite a strong stimulus, but once use is continued, it becomes negative. Um, it also noted that uh, the effects within the brain regions were directly correlated to the number of receptors within those regions. And the amygdala is the highest or one of the highest densities of steroid receptor in the brain. And it appears to be one of the areas that is majoritarily or majorly affected by uh, androgen use. So they discovered a direct correlation there. 
Um, so it would would look like, well, it more than look like, this study supports the fact that steroid use affects our reactions to fear. It also shows an increase in white matter and a decrease in grey matter. Now, white matter is um, involved in our responsiveness, our impulsivity. So we, we've got subdued signaling or reduced signaling to the amygdala, which means we have a disruption within our perception of fear and anxiety and depression and such like, and risk. We've got an increase in white matter, which would increase our impulsivity, so our reactionary to a stimulus. Um, and, uh, hang on a minute. It shows that the brains do have a direct impact on both brain function and brain signaling, particularly under usage. In some elements of brain signaling, it continues post usage. Um, obviously, how much this affects somebody in the real world is down to the individual. Uh, you know, you can't really say that everyone's going to have the same level of suffering. Uh, and end of day, this, this study isn't without its limitations. You know, it, it, it doesn't list drug dosage levels within individuals uh, and those sort of things. And it accepts that, you know, there needs to be further study on this. Uh, um especially as this study was only only done on males, so they, they suggest that there needs to be looked at uh, females as well. Um, but the bottom line is, this study proves that steroids affect our resting brain function and our response to emotional stimulus. Our interactions and our resting states of fear and depression and our cognitive function. You know, I find it quite, quite ironic actually, because you go back three, four years, and I did this myself, anyone involved in harm reduction or in the study of steroids within harm reduction processes, roid rage doesn't exist. It's a myth. It doesn't exist at all. And the old stereotype of, of a steroid user being thick and being angry was absolute bullshit. Yet we've sort of come full circle now, and we're now seeing that steroids do actually lower our levels of intellect, and they do actually make us more aggressive. There's no denying it. Um, how that aggression is perceived, be it irritability or whatever, but there's no denying that steroids do make us more aggressive. And it's I find it quite quite interesting how it's come full circle. Um, and that the old adage and the old stereotype, which was just born from observation and nothing else, actually stands to some degree true. Right, I'm going to get off. Hopefully that made some fucking sense. Um, if it didn't, I apologise. And no doubt you will tell me in the comments like you normally do. Uh, I will look into more stuff. I've got still got a stack of studies to go through, um, and I'll get some more videos up as and when I get through them. But thank you very much for your time, folks. Take care, and I'll catch up with you soon.